hi welcome to the fit and healthy today show and as a continuation on our youthing or anti-aging series today I'm going to talk about the theories of aging and I know it seems a little bit boring but I want you to have a good uh, conception of what uh, or causes the aging process and then later in further series we're going to talk about how we can stop it and then to some extent even reverse it but you have to have a good basic understanding of why it happens and the things that cause it to occur now there's a lot of theories and I think probably there's a little bit of truth in every one of these theories there's no one thing that causes us to age it's a combination of a lot of different factors number one starting with our DNA and our genetics what our parents give us from the start and you know I know people who are 90 years old who smoke and they've smoked all their lives and yet they don't have any cancer and yet I know people who are in their 40s who die of lung cancer so your genetics or your genetic propensities towards certain diseases may have a very huge impact on whether or not you're going to have aging based upon your DNA uh, uh, your genetics so you've got an inherited blueprint but the problem lies is that you can change that blueprint so you can have a family history a very long life and you add in toxins pollutants radiation diet and lifestyle problems alcohol tobacco all those types of things failure to exercise and basically what you're going to do is these uh, cells as they replicate their RNA DNA won't rep replicate property and they will mutate and I'll be doggone you're going to end up with the inability to repair the body so you will age quicker um, nutrients also or the nutrient deficiencies also affect your RNA DNA replication as well but bottom line is these types of things interfere or cause uh, the production of certain types of abnormal proteins and enzymes which lead to the de defective cellular repair and genetic mutations in a nutshell I could spend a couple hours on this subject alone but in a nutshell so your DNA RNA so you're gonna look to your family history and what your weaknesses are so obviously um, if you have lung weaknesses in your family and people tend to die of that or heart disease you're going to do everything you can genetically to try and slow that process down so that you don't die of those particular uh, genetic propensities neuroendocrine theory um, we have pituitary the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus deep within inside the brain regulate the release of uh, key hormones in the body that stimulate gosh our hunger our thirst our all of our hormones female and male our body's ability to burn off fat our growth hormones our repair basically all of the biochemical functions of the cells the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland are responsible for producing the regulation of these hormones now what happens is generally with time the secretion of these hormones decrease and when you add these factors mentioned up above here then it acceler accelerates that process not allowing the proper metabolism of those hormones so uh, I gave an example on here for example um, when we talk about IGF-1 the in human insulin like growth hormone factor which in turn produces HGH human growth hormone which is what kind of helps us grow initially when we're um, young but as we grow older it keeps us young what happens is is it increases bottom line the insulin sensitivity and the body mass and reduces body fat which in turn you can build muscle and the nerves and the problem is is if you interfere or have these toxins interfere with the IGF-1 production you are not going to be able to produce growth hormone and when you don't produce growth hormone you age fast very fast your vascular system ages if you've got diabetes your peripheral nerves burn and tingle so that's just one example there are hundreds probably thousands of other examples I could give you regarding uh, the neuroendocrine system in theory so once again toxins pollutants radiation diet and lifestyle affect the neuroendocrine system thus affecting 
how all your hormones work in your body, triggering cancers and everything else. Cross-linking theory. Now, also known, it's a process also known as glycation. And I tried to explain this and everything on here as, as direct as I can and give you as much information as I can without getting too complex. But bottom line, glycation occurs when you have sugars and reactive compounds, these called, um, that attach to free amino acid groups. Thus, in turn, they saddle themselves. They attach themselves to the proteins. And these proteins, in turn, kind of like form a glue <laughs> around your cells. And then what happens then, in turn, you have free radicals form. And these free radicals, and we'll talk about the free radical theory here in a moment, um, bind uh, to healthy compounds and pretty much contribute to your body's inability to properly replicate. So what happens is, is you accelerate cellular death, and in turn, you cause cancer, bottom line. So lots of research currently going on on cross-linking and how to block certain glycation. There's a supplement I know called carnosine that's helpful in that, but we're going to get into that in the later shows. Um, as mentioned before, we've got the free radical or oxidation theory, the rusting theory. And once again, we've got all the other things above, the pollutants, radiation, alcohol, tobacco, diet, causing um, very highly reactive um, particles. And what happens is, is they end up with, gosh, please try to remember your chemistry if you can from high school. You'll end up with um, uneven number of electrons in, in the um, outer uh, of the atoms. And what happens is these seek to bind to other unstable compounds and bind them up. And in turn, then, it'll prevent healthy compounds from keeping the oxidative, uh, or it'll accelerate the oxidative process, keeping the healthy compounds from being able to do their job in the body. So what happens as a result, your cellular energy gets decreased, your rusting oxidation process occurs. Um, the founder of this particular theory is a professor out of the University of Nebraska, and we basically believe that this is probably because of all the chemicals we have in our environments and in our vaccines and other things, probably one of the major reasons why we have so many degenerative disorders and why they're coming at a younger and younger age because of all the um, what we call free radicals that are binding. Now, when people are nutritionally, or nutritionally deficient in antioxidants, these antioxidants are what bind to free radicals and prevent them from doing their damage. Nutritionally wise in our food and, and otherwise, we are so antioxidant deficient that it allows these free radicals to run wild, causing a lot of the cancers, hardening of the arteries, arthritis, so on and so forth. Uh, there's another uh, theory called the immune theory. And basically what it says, um, your thymus gland produces most of your killer T, well, your killer T cells in your body. And your, your killer T's, along with other things, it's a little bit more complicated than this, identify friend from foe. And what happens when you add the pollutants, radiation, alcohol, tobacco, and all of that, one teaspoon of sugar suppresses the immune system for four to six hours. And you add all this on top of it, you're going to get your body less able to produce these killer T's and identify friend from foe. It's going to not be able to produce the adequate amounts of antibodies, microphages, uh, and so you're not going to be able to detect the invaders, which in turn allows these invaders to invade your healthy cells and give you cancer, autoimmune disorders, incurable viruses, so on and so forth. So bottom line, Keeping the immune system healthy elongates life. The uh, telomere theory. Now, this is a little complex in that you have to understand that chromosomes, and I, I wrote this on here as best I can, and I can always give you a copy of this at the store. Um, these are like the little uh, cap-like structures that sit on the end of the, uh, the chromosomes and aid in the replication of most cells. Usually it replicates about 50 times a cell can, and then slowly but surely the telomere gets shorter and shorter 
and it doesn't have an ability to replicate any longer. Well, what happens is the smoking, obesity, stress, nutrient deficiencies, particularly vitamin D. Now, mind you, doctors are saying, you get everything from your food. That's a bunch of baloney. You can't and you don't in today's agricultural world. You do not. So please ignore that. That is not correct. Um, I'm, I'm a nutritionist, and basically, <clears throat> in most of the good modern-day nutrition books, they tell you you are not going to get it from your food in today's world. But what happens is, as these um, uh, telomeres get shorter and shorter, they can replicate fewer and fewer times. What occurs is, as we lose, let's see here. I wanted to give you the basic, yeah, I guess I didn't uh, add an additional because I thought it'd be too complicated. As we lose these telomeres, what happens then, or as we expose the telomeres to this damage, they can replicate fewer and fewer times. So what happens is you, when a normal cell may replicate 50 times, when the telomeres are shortened, they may only replicate maybe 20 or 25 times. So keeping in mind, there's a, there are certain enzymes which uh, telomerase, which they're researching now that perhaps can prevent some of this um, aging process. Lots of research. Once again, bear with me. I know this is a little complicated, but you kind of need to understand how complicated it is so that we can backtrack and in turn try to make it as easy as we can. A lot of research on stem cells. Now, stem cells are our base cells that we are born with and that we now know we produce additionally. We don't just have a finite number at birth. We do replicate them if we have adequate amounts of nutrition and nutritional support. So the theory states, however, that we lose the number of uh, our stem cell reserves. And as a result, we can't, these stem cells, which are, are kind of like the blueprint of everything, we don't have the ability to proper replicate the cells and then we end up with more dysfunctional cells as a result of aging. So when new stem cells are produced, then we age very slowly and we can live that 120 years. So a lot of research going on in this regard for spinal cord injuries and, and other uh, types of uh, particularly nerve uh, injuries. Cell metabolic theory. New theory relatively in the last 10 years, and basically what it says is that the more obese you are, the more junk you eat, the more calories you intake, you shorten your life. And it has been shown that a more calorie restricted diet um, does lengthen life. Um, the, the reason behind the theory is that the calorie restricted diet kind of slows the process by decreasing oxygen rich free radicals that we talked about earlier produced by the mitochondria. So in turn, your metabolic, cellular metabolic doesn't burn so hot and burn itself out basically is what it is. So um, the cells can divide properly, we don't get a burnout. We don't have cellular mutations. This theory kind of goes with some of the other theories. And if you've noticed, they kind of blanket upon each other and they intertwine in the inner circle. That's why this is so complex. And when we're looking at anti-aging, the things for anti-aging, why it is so complex to discuss because there's so many different factors. Um, nutritional deficiencies. Now, this is my realm and the realm I feel the most comfortable with. Bottom line, inadequate intake of nutrients. And if I can get people to eat six to 10 servings of clean fruits and vegetables, that means organic, sustained organic, no chemicals, even then, I'm gonna have a very hard time getting them the adequate amounts of nutrients. And I just threw um, some statistics out here for you. 90% of seniors are one in magnesium deficient, 90%. So I don't want to hear the docs say you can get everything from your diet because it's not true and it's not backed by the National Institute of Health. It's just not. So the NIH, 30 to 40 percent are deficient in vitamin A, niacin, B12, vitamin C, iron, name it. You throw an aspirin upon this iron deficiency with bleeding, 
which you have a 50% chance of having bleeding within five years after you start your aspirin therapy. Um, you're going to end up with a lot of nutrient deficiency. So a lot of medications and drugs also block your nutrient absorption in addition to not getting adequate amount of food. Only 10% of seniors get adequate amounts of protein. And this kind of blew me away because I only know of one doctor in town that tends to promote any protein addition to the diet. And he deals primarily with geri uh, geriatrics, Dr. Lindbergh and trying to get his uh, senior clients, patients, to eat more protein. You cannot repair without adequate amounts of protein. It just doesn't happen. Last but not, not least, lack of exercise creates the risk of dying from all other causes. So you don't move, you're going to die at a much earlier, earlier weight. Probably the best example I could give you, a friend of mine likes to go skiing in Vail, Colorado. And he has these 80 and 90 year old German Olympic skiers, you know, they're going down the slopes, they're moving just like they're 20 years old. And he, he talks to them and says, how do you stay so young? And they say, we don't stop moving. Okay, I'm going to end this segment on that note. Next, we're going to be moving on to the, in this particular case, uh, breathing part of our show, which is the fitness portion. Thank you. Welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And today we're going to do some yoga breathing. Um, I've had a lot of reports of incidents at my uh, health food store about asthma happening. As allergies are starting to rise, I'm, we're seeing more and more asthma. So um, I myself have experienced this and have utilized this particular breath routine to help lessen the asthma, or especially reactive asthma that seems to be environmentally caused. The first exercise is basically where you inhale, lift the shoulders, exhale forcefully um, through the nostrils. So inhale, probably uh, anywhere from six to eight times. And it will not give you that hyperventilation um, feel because basically you're inhaling through the nostrils. So you're going to oxygenate really, really well while you're doing that. Now that's called fire breathing. What we like to do after then is we like to calm the fire down. And that entails taking a breath in and expanding the abdominal. And you can kind of see how my abdominals work. Well, what we like to do is we like to inhale through the nostrils and expand the abdominal and then contract the abdominals and exhale through the nostril. And what you do is you contract it and contract it and contract it and contract it so that you can no longer have any more breath. Expand the abdominals and then inhale. So you inhale, contract the abdominals, cave it in, 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 hold it. Expand the abdominals and breathe in. And what you'll notice then is oftentimes your breathing will return to normal and your asthmatic symptoms will dissipate. Next, we're going to be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show. And with us today is Ralph Dorciano. Thank Ralph. you for the intro. Now to start off with, a lot of diabetics out there and a lot of diabetics on medication, especially one known as metformin, formerly known as glucophage. Well, they looked at about 13 randomized clinical trials, basically covering close to about 13,000 patients, and discovered one interesting thing about metformin, which was not discovered in anybody else, outside of it having no benefit for cardiovascular disease, heart disease, whatever. They discovered if you're not overweight and you're taking glucophage, aka metformin, it may kill you faster, outside of not yielding you any benefit at all. All right, this was on the PLS, Public Library of Science Online. They suggested the long-term benefit of this drug compared to the risk are not clearly established, number one. 
Remember, Metaphorum has been around since what, 1920? Then forgotten about for a little while and rediscovered in 1940. Not exactly your most technologically advanced pharmaceutical that's out there. However, an overlooked finding from this study was, overlooked being buried or conveniently ignored, that in non-overweight people with type 2 diabetes, metformin may have actually increased the risk of death. And also, again, they compared this with other diabetic, anti-diabetic treatments. Metform, the authors say, may be the one with the least amount of disadvantages. So, what's that code for? Meaning out of all diabetic drugs that are out there, this one will probably kill you the slowest. So, if you're taking glucophage, aka metform, you have two choices. Either one, discuss with your doctor getting off of it because it yields you no benefit, or two, start gaining weight. All right, as we move into the next one, acne. They've discovered one very interesting herb that beat benzoyl peroxide in its acne treatments. Thyme. How you whether say thyme or thyme, T-H-Y-M-E. This was presented at the Society of General Microbiology, the Spring Conference in Dublin. They found out the herbal preparations of thyme can be more effective at treating skin acne than prescription creams. Now, all they did was took an alcohol tincture. They didn't make a special formulation with cream or medical this. They just took thyme, the little tincture, and they compared it with other herbs and stuff like that, including alcohol as a base to make sure it wasn't the alcohol that was doing the job. And thyme itself beat the prescriptions. They also said, too, the problem with treatments containing benzoyl peroxide is the side effects they are associated with. A burning sensation and skin irritation are not uncommon. Herbal preparations are less harsh on the skin due to their anti-inflammatory properties, while results suggest they can be just as, if not more, effective than chemical treatments. Pretty interesting thing. Got some acne, got a lot of hope, something very simple out there to utilize to see if it works. Just simple fine. Not a fancy cream, just a little tincture itself. Very common in health food stores. Now, the Rocky World type statements. LDL cholesterol, most likely LDL-C. They discovered something, or I shouldn't say discovered something, they knew about something for quite some time. And they probably close to over 20 years. That low LDL cholesterol is associated with an increased risk of cancer. Now, the study here was basically not to find out what low LDL is associated with cancer. That they pretty much established. They wanted to know if the drugs cause cancer. But this is what they came across. And this was promote, this was published at the American College of Cardiology's 61st annual scientific session. So previous studies of cholesterol drug drugs have suggested a strong association between low levels of LDL, C, and cancer risk. There has been some debate as whether or not medications used to lower cholesterol may contribute to cancer, but the evidence so far tells us that the drugs themselves do not increase the risk of cancer. Well, lowering your LDL is kind of an indirect way of increasing your risk of cancer, whether drugs do it or not. What they're attempting to do here, honestly, is probably start to develop a legal defense saying basically, no, the drugs are not the cause of the cancer. Your low LDL is your cause of the cancer. Yeah, it's splitting hairs, but legality-wise, it may just save their butt. But that was not necessarily the intent of the study. They looked at people for over 20 years, and throughout the study, people with lower LDL were always more prone to cancer. So it's something to think about. All right, now to the swine flu vaccine. In Finland, they looked at a study, they noticed that the swine flu, especially uh, the one form of vaccine called Pandem, uh, can never say it, Pandem Rix vaccine, used for the flu pandemic of 2009. And this was also published in the March 28th Public Library of Science online. What they discovered is an increased risk of narcolepsy. How much? Well, over a person that was not vaccinated, it was 17 times greater in children. The reason this didn't come out in the prior study is because it doesn't seem to cause narcolepsy in adults. But children around the age of nine, it was 17 times greater. 
Now there's one interesting thing that was also buried in the data, in the study. Again, the March 28th PLOS, Public Library of Science Online, which is extremely damning to all vaccinations. That they definitely will at least correlate strongly, if not causative, cause neurological conditions. Due to the fact they needed a control group, they had to look at vaccinated children, the swine flu vaccine, and non-vaccinated children. Well in, non well, in non-vaccinated children, the chance of getting narcolepsy was 0.7 per 100,000 vaccinations. In the vaccinated group, it was 9 per 100,000. That's 13 <coughs> times an increase. Now, what that correlates is just with narcolepsy, but it definitely shows evidence that it does have an impact on the neurological system overall. And they looked at children vaccinated between 1991 and 2005. So looked at people for over 14 years. That's pretty strong track record of vaccines creating neurological issues in children. Something to think about strongly think about, especially if your state's trying to mandate vaccines that don't have the data to support it. All right, now we look at pancreatic cancer. Well, the common chemo drug for pancreatic cancer seems not to work very well at all. And I think it was called, uh, can I pronounce it right, gemcitabine. But they did find something, actually known for quite some time, that works very well against pancreatic cancer. And you may recognize it in health food stores as evening primrose oil or borage oil. What it is? It's the polyunsaturated fat called GLA, gamma linolenic acid. And this was basically found out by the Mayo Clinic pathologist Ruth Lupo and printed in the American Association for Cancer Research Annual Meeting 2012. They found that the GLA in no words, reduced cancer growth in the pancreas by 85%, mm -hmm. while a chemo drug virtually did nothing at all. So what they're trying to do is trying to combine the GLA with the chemo drug. My question is, if the chemo drug's ineffective, why do it at all? Mm -hmm. Just gives them even primrose oil or borage oil and maybe get much greater effects without the side effects. And that's just to give you an idea. Again, published in the American Association for Cancer Research meeting 2012. And just to side up, to finish up here, they found out that the average American sits for 90% of his leisure time he spends sitting. Well, if you spend 11 or more hours sitting per day, your chance of death in the next three years is 40%. So an increased risk of dying. Sorry, not 40%, but an increased risk of dying 40% over three years. And that was the Archives of Internal Medicine. Well, my time is up, and thank you for that. Thank you very much, Ralph. We appreciate you watching the show. Do your research and join us for our further shows on aging and further research with Ralph. Thank you again for joining us.